reactive training systems. All right, welcome back to the RTS podcast. I'm Coach Mike, and today I'm talking to the one and only Panna. How's it going, man? Yeah, pretty, pretty good, pretty good. I just want to say that I'm really, really excited to be here with you, and I've said it on the King of the Lift podcast, and I said it to yourself when we met a couple of months ago. But yeah, you are one of my biggest inspirations, and I think to a lot of other powerlifting coaches. So it's just an honor to do that podcast with you. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. And I have been watching you do your work from a distance for quite some time. And I think everyone agrees that French powerlifting has really become forced to be reckoned with on the world stage. And that has a lot to do with the work that you've done, uh, you. which is a big reason why I'm a huge training nerd. One <laughs> of the big reasons why I wanted to have a conversation with you is because I mean, I had too much time to just talk shop about training and lifting stuff yet, either personally or other podcasts or anything like that. thought it might be fun to, to just talk shop, pick your brain a bit and find out what there's always things that we could be doing better. So I'll learn something new here. Me too, hopefully. <laughs> I think it probably goes without saying kind of you're a well-known figure in current powerlifting. So I don't think we need to spend a lot on introductions, but I, I do just want to spell out a few accolades that, that you have, that you're a former world champion, world record holder, a coach, all around champion promoter of, of powerlifting. And that you've really been, you've been at this for several years now, but really became, I would say like a force in the 66 class. Would you say in like 2020, would that be the time frame where you became more competitive internationally? So 2019 was my first world's appearance. And that's actually where I met you for the first time. So I was, I was like a kid, you know, in the warm-up room. <laughs> and it was, honestly, it was Tim French's first big appearance in 2019. Mm -hmm. Because we had Euros 2018 where Leah had done huge meet. Back then, I was also coaching uh, Noemi Alaber, the French 52 world champion record holder, world record holder. And back then, I was coaching her. And at Euros, she also had done something crazy. So when we approached 2019, I was like, and nobody was was talking of the of of Europe in general, like not to mention France, but no single. European country was mentioned back then on podcast, whatever, King of the Lifts were, was really, really hyping the US because, you know, that's where the strongest lifter, lifters were, either from the male or the female side. And then I remember 2019, I was like, this has to be the first European splash, more as French splash. And so I was really happy because like back then I was coaching Leah and Noemi. And they both did a podium. I think Leah placed third and Noemi placed second. So Leah in the 63 and Noemi in the 47s back then. And, you know, I was like, okay, then now it's my turn to do something cool, to do a podium, whatever. And then, you know, France is on the map. And this didn't go as planned. I think I finished fifth, something like that. And on that day, on that day I just beat off more than I could choose, so to speak. It was my first really big international event. I had a lot of anticipation. And I made some plans that just weren't realistic with my strength level. So ended up, I think I ended up like hitting one lift on every movement and, and that was pretty much it. But yeah. yeah, thanks to the female's performance, yeah, France was on the map. And then after, after that, sadly, COVID hit and no competitions for the 2020 year. And then, yeah, 2021 was the year where things started to move really, really fast in France, like the lockdown weirdly enough, did a lot of good things for powerlifting in France because everybody was at home on Insta, YouTube, whatever. Everybody was looking at the videos and everybody was noticing, oh, that's a sport. Oh, you just squat your bench, you deadlift, that's a sport. You can be part of Team Friends. You can be World Champ doing that. That's already what I do, but I just do more accessory stuff besides that. But I still love doing my squat, bench, deadlift. So, And yeah, it, it just blew in France. And I w in my head, I was like, okay, once the comps, things will explode. And so that's that's what happened in 2021. And hopefully that year was a, a really good year for me as an athlete and as a coach because I won every meet as a 66 in 2021. So French nationals, Euros and Worlds. And the athletes that I was coaching or still am coaching, so Leah and, and Tiff, they both won, uh, you know, Euros, Worlds, whatever. So yeah, so that's when I think people started really to notice and not not just like from myself and my team but also 
other athletes athletes in France uh, right now, specifically uh, speak, thinking of Corentin, Rudy Forever on Insta, who's really, really a, a super, super strong athlete, a really, really talented coach, also influenced by yourself. So yeah, so I think that's where everything blew in France. And here we are today. Yeah, I've had the privilege to coach a few French lifters here and there. And I think even if you don't coach them directly, you have a lot of influence on training styles and norms and behaviors among French lifters, to be sure that the, it's obvious that our influence is strongest, closest to home. So what do you think? I'm sure that you've thought about this, like differences in in your styles of training, styles that, of training that you prefer and that you tend to encourage uh, versus styles of training that, that you see encouraged elsewhere. Do you have anything that comes to mind as like some of the major stylistic differences and preferences? Yeah, absolutely. So I wouldn't say that I'm anti-accessories, but I'm pro-specificity. And so I think, to my knowledge, the biggest difference that I have and that we have here in France to other areas such as the US, for instance, is we're extremely big on squats, bench, deadlift, close variations, and not a whole lot, per, even sometimes no single accessory movement at all. I think I would say that's the biggest difference from what I see and from what I, I, I understand from the meta. But yeah, I would say that's the biggest difference. Yeah. So... I don't I think it's fine if we talk about some specifics here, <laughs> most likely fine. But in the case of Leah, when she started working with Ben and Jason, it probably wasn't a big departure from the specificity sense of things then, because I believe they have a pretty similar philosophy in terms of exercise selection and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so absolutely. I think there are differences, though, in perhaps how they view the importance of intensity or volume, which may go back to your point on this. Is that correct? Yeah. There's definitely a perception that you have a preference for really high intensity work. Even I don't know if this is just like the social media distortion of just like the things that we tend to see tend to be the heavier singles and things like that. But does that encompass maybe even a majority of your training or does it appear in the year-round fashion for you so it's it's funny you mentioned it because uh from what i i think people think of me or my style of training or programming i think there is they assume like single rp10 and triple rp10 and whatever and the the funny aspect of that is you only have the scope of what i post on social media right and obviously like, I understand that people do want to do that, to post like 1x6 or P7, and that's cool, but that's not what I, I want to post on my social media, for instance. So it's easy to have things completely distorted because you you see what I, I only post, you know what I mean? And again, for me, there's no single point of posting like the 5x7 with 170 kilos on squat that I, done, I did on Tuesday, and I'd rather post a single quite heavy or something because that's that's what i like to see me personally when i scroll on insta so that's what i want to show obviously and the thing is i think i would say that i have a quite yeah a, a quite specific approach but also i do use a lot of variation in the intensity spectrum that i decide to to use to program or to work with for instance one one style of of programming that i really like is having a, a quite high intensity single and then having more volume stuff way lighter like 70 75 percent of the single that you hit and really having more movement in that session and less overall stress fatigue because of those heavier loads and, and sets so that's for instance something that i really like and if you if you would ask me what i would program i would probably go that way rather than having a five by three or p7 or eight which could be i think way more taxing to a certain degree on that aspect but obviously i don't i don't reject any pattern of programming it's more so i have the ones that i i i like the most and i sure. think are the most bang for my buck and also some others that i would go to but way way less often but yeah, yeah. to answer your question shortly so my when i started in france so basically i think i was brought to that not ideas and to that 
philosophy because of what was happening in France back then. So back then in France, if you wanted to do powerlifting, every coach was like, so you'll do 20 accessories and then you'll do maybe three sets of, squ of squats per week. And to my knowledge, I was like, nobody does that in any other sport. Like it's, it's as if yeah. a, a soccer player, a basketball player, whatever, will do 100% cardio and then once every two weeks, he'll do like a 10 minutes game. No, that's not how it works, right. you know? <laughs> so I think I probably went to the extreme because of that, because everybody was doing that to that extreme. And so I think in order to create some balance, I probably went extreme the other way. But yeah, to, to, to sum it up, that's pretty much my whole philosophy of training. It would be, if you're a powerlifter, you have to powerlift. If you are a soccer player, you have to play soccer, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, other qualities, other things have to be developed. That's for sure. But for me, the most important ones will be the ones closest to your sport. And we go back to that specificity idea. Yeah, definitely. I've been running into an issue lately where we find more and more lifters. This sounds like a negative, but it just is. I don't mean to cast any sort of value judgment on it, but more and more lifters seem to be unable to tolerate highly specific, high stress training, like heavy singles, meaning eight RPE or above back off work. If we're anywhere in the seven RPE or above range, it seems to really cause a lot of fatigue for lifters. And this does seem to be a difference that I've noticed more in the last I don't know, handful of years. And if you go back more toward the beginning of my career, it, it didn't seem to be so commonplace to, to have people with those kinds of recovery issues. Do you tend to see that very much? Or is that not something that tends to pop up for you? And then uh, how do you deal with it if you've got somebody who seems not recover well enough from that type of work? Obviously, I have my own biases, like everybody. Yeah. But I really tend to, and, and I think that's one of the biggest things that I learned from, from you. I think the two biggest things that I learned from you would be, number one, there, the single rule is that there is no rule. As long as you have coherent approach, you, you can do pretty much anything you want. Maybe, maybe I'm paraphrasing it. So if, if you don't agree with what I understand from your work, obviously, let me know. But uh, that's what I, I get from that. It's that. And, and again, that, I think I, understand, I understood it that way because of what was happening in France. Because in France, if you weren't doing that at that moment, you screw you screwed everything up and you'll bob out of your out of your meat. That was pretty much the idea. Yeah. So it really was reassuring from you for for me to see somebody like yourself that was already accomplished when I started off as a coach and as an athlete to be like, sometimes I don't know, and sometimes I'll just do a trial and error and see how it goes. But I will always keep track of what I did and how things went and try to always find answers and solutions to the to the problems that I will encounter. And I think that was one of the things that opened my eyes. I was like, whoa, that's actually pretty cool, you know? And being a big nerd, a big gamer myself, I like to always, you know, you have one stuff and then there is another meta. So you have to change your stuff. You have to farm something else and change, et cetera, et cetera. So for me, that was exactly what I needed to hear. And I, I, I needed to hear from, I needed to hear it from somebody in your position that there is no single answer for everything and you you sometimes have to get your hands dirty to to find to find answers and yeah. solutions so that was number one and then number two so pretty much the rule is that you can do pretty much whatever you want as long as you remain within a certain scope and as long as you keep track of everything you're doing and and finding always solutions and then number two was you have to practice your sport man i, I think there's no other way around it you just have to practice the sport but also you also have to give a lot of credit, a lot of focus and attention to the athlete that you're working with. Because at the end of the day, your job as a coach isn't to impose your philosophy of training on somebody, it's to help somebody out. That's pretty much it. So I would much rather have, I would personally much rather work with a coach that maybe doesn't, isn't as intelligent as somebody else, but is way more focused on myself and my feelings, how I, how I think, of stuff and and our communication rather than working with a genius that has a phd whatever but then doesn't give a flying f about what i think yeah. what i feel etc and it's it's obvious that rts is is based on that on the athlete response the athlete feedback and i think as long as you have those ideas in mind if you're i don't want to say smart in the way like clever but if you're if you can find ways 
if you can if you have ideas that you're willing to put up to the test and monitor the result and and you are not afraid to fail and the athlete isn't afraid to fail then i think you can you can develop something really really cool yeah no i definitely agree with that and i think that something that you really touched on there is one of the biggest values of having a coach is the attention that the coach can pay to the program that like you said having someone with maybe a bit of knowledge a bit of experience who's willing to pay attention and try hard is worth a lot more than the genius coach who no longer has time to pay attention to the athlete that just doesn't do you any good and i definitely agree with the first point as well as there's not really a lot of a lot going on in the way of rules with regard to training there's a saying that I came across of if it looks stupid but it works then it's not stupid <laughs> and it kind of reminds me of that saying a little bit that i've definitely had some training interventions that are unconventional but if you try it and it works then hey then at least you know that at least you know that it works on that aspect i think there is one thing that i think i never mentioned anywhere so it's extremely rare that one of the athletes that i coach right now or that i coached like for the last two years three years maybe doesn't have an sbd day every saturday it's mm. extremely rare like 99.9% .9 of the time sbd days saturdays are always sbd days usually with singles not always not all the time but usually so we practice that sport uh on comps usually when i was training you know i was doing like the pretty much basic split, like squat, bench, then bench, deadlift, then bench, then squat, bench, then bench, deadlift, whatever. And on, on middays, I was drained. I was exhausted by deadlifts, always, all the time. And then I was like, maybe that's something I can train. Maybe that's a quality I can train to have the, have the habit to, to, do, to perform SBD days and not by deadlifts, be completely drained and I want to go home. I, I can't feel my legs anymore. My back is sore, whatever. And so I, I like to experiment on myself first. So I experimented on myself with for quite some time, quite some months. And then I was like, oh, that works. And on my next comp by deadlift, I was like, yeah, I'm fine. Tomorrow I can train. And I actually trained the very next day because SBD days for me weren't like, oh, I have one meet a year or two meets a year. And that's the big stuff. It was, yeah, it's another SBD day like every Saturday. So, but the only difference is instead of doing it at the gym, I'm doing it at the comp in front of judges, whatever. So, sure. yeah. So your saying kind of reminded me of that was, for me it was, yeah, maybe this dumb idea could work, like ultra specificity, push, push to the limit. And that's what I did. And right now, like, Maybe with beginners, I won't implement that because I think SBD days can be quite taxing and I will probably wait like six to six months to a year before implementing it on a beginner. But yeah, if, if somebody that is already quite trained uh, comes to me for coaching, then yeah, I will probably have them do an SBD day every week unless, you know, this doesn't work for whatever reason. But then when, when the, uh, the competition comes, you're like, yeah, something that you already did hundred times this year so yeah. it's the hundred and first time doesn't change a whole lot yeah but it's uh, similar to something that i noticed about singles in general some quite a few years ago now but when i was coming up in the sport there was a kind of this stigma against definitely against training with singles or doing anything really with 90 percent and above weights that it was supposed to be this ultra taxing sort of Thing. You don't touch 90% above weight because it fries your CNS and all this stuff. And it became the self-fulfilling sort of thing because you would go months at a time and not touch weights that were that heavy. So when you did, yeah, it was very taxing. But then when I got away from that a bit and said, I'm going to just keep doing it and try to train that quality, doing singles consistently every week and then adding it in on SDE exercises and things like that, it... it turns out it's a trainable quality as well. You handle singles a lot. It becomes not such a big deal. Now they're not so fatiguing. It doesn't seem to really take it out of you like it does when you never touch those weights. And I think a lot of it is, I mean, we could get into why it is that way, but I think a lot of it comes back to psychology. And if you never put yourself in that situation, then you're just not conditioned for it. So I think it does make a lot of sense from a theoretical standpoint. I guess a tactical question for you then with regard to the SBD work, do you make any sort of concessions on the squat work for an SBD session? Do you limit the squatting? 
in some way so that you're not bringing too much fatigue into the deadlift portion of that workout? Yeah, so on that aspect, I would definitely do it specifically to the athletes. So for instance, Tiffany squats, so Tiffany Chapon, 47 world champ, she squats four times a week. So, you know, that's, that's quite a lot of, of frequency, volume, stress on squats. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for an athlete that has that much squat effort practice, then yeah, usually I will start the block with less intensity on, on that squat day for the SBD session and have it more on the bench and the deadlift. But then usually when we go closer and closer to the comp, then I won't have that difference in terms of intensity on squats because, again, I like to have this idea where, so when, when you're doing a, a comp, when you're doing a meet, when deadlift comes, you have, usually you have drained it on squats. You have hit your uh, one by one RP10 on squats. So you have to learn also how to deadlift with that squat fatigue still, still upon yeah. you. So usually to, to kick off the block, yeah, the squat intensity will be lower on that SBD day. But then when we go closer and closer to the end of the block or we're in the specific block for a meet, then the squat in intensity will be matching the, the deadlift intensity usually. Yeah, and that's I think, a good point. I think another thing that you just mentioned, so not only I think it, it has a, a psychological effect, if you never do singles, then you could really be afraid of hitting a single or not truly really know the kind of mindset and mentality you have to attack that way. But also what I would say, I would say it has a huge, huge, huge impact on technique. And, you know, for me, technique isn't, so it's, it's not the biggest deal of them all, but it's not something like, oh yeah, technique, you know what I mean? For me, it's really one of the main aspects. And I think I would say that I focus as as much on technique as I do on the programming aspect of things with the athletes that I coach. And um, like you said, sometimes then you go into a meet and you're like, I, I don't know how to do a single because I haven't practiced that enough. But then I think it, it can have an impact on the mentality aspect, but definitely on the technical aspect because the way you, you handle a triple, even at 85%, 88%, something quite heavy, isn't close to how you handle a single with like RP9, 95%, 97%, whatever. That's, it doesn't come close. So what I, and, and that's something is, personally, I'm not afraid of failing a lift in the gym. And that's what I say to the athletes that I coach. Obviously, if you're failing like three times a session, every session, there is a problem, right? And we have to, you have, we have to discuss that. If you fail from time to time, even if it's something, you, it should be an RP8, 8.5 and you fail it, then yeah, obviously RPE is also based on technique. And that's something usually that people tend to forget. If your technique was subpar on that day, something that was supposed to be RP8 could be a fail. And I think a couple of days ago, you posted something in your story that happened to yourself where you failed the squat because your focus yeah. wasn't there. Then you regroup and then boom, you hit your top set. So you failed a warm up lift. So it's, yeah. it's, yeah, you can definitely fail an RP8 if your technique is garbage on that day. Yeah, definitely. And it, there's a difference between an outright fail and I just screwed something up. That's what, so in my instance, I just, I guess to, to summarize, I was warming up. It was a weight that should be like my last warm up, and I missed it, had to dump the bar and everything. It was bad. But I, I knew that's not supposed to be a missed attempt. So I took the weight back down to two plates and then warmed up all over again. And went back up and made that weight and exceeded it and didn't quite get to my original plan, but it just wasn't there that day, but did exceed the mark that I had missed and hit it for a single at seven. So it wasn't that I just wasn't strong enough for that day, but both in the gym when I, when that happened and in conversation with people online afterwards, people were surprised that several things that I retook my warm ups, like why bother doing that? Doesn't that just add a bunch of extra fatigue? And also, like, why did I decide to do that anyway? Like, usually after a miss, especially a missed warm up, a lot of people are like, I just don't have it. I'm going home. I don't know. I, I, and I, I've been struggling to try to describe it in a way that that would be useful to people, because what I keep coming back to is just new. I think it's a leaning on experience kind of thing. I just knew that I had messed something up and that it was fixable. You know, and I also knew that I've done it before where I've missed weights or had really grindy reps and you just retake it. And it's also a, another miss or another grindy rep by going back down and warming up again 
reestablishing some movement and getting some momentum, uh, psychologically putting some distance between the misrep and what I'm currently doing. And it just ends up being a better performance. Is there a, a bit more fatigue? But it's just warm ups. It's, yeah. It shouldn't be that fatiguing anyway. Yeah. I I think it's it's crazy to see that in every other sport, failure is part of the process. But weirdly yeah. enough, in powerlifting, we don't we don't want to acknowledge that fact. Like uh, an Olympic weightlifter will probably miss I don't know how many snatches or cleans or whatever a week. You know, probably every two weeks. I'm I'm not that big on Olympic weightlifting, so. But I've seen a lot of like you know they try sure. to catch it and then they bail out of it because the balance is off, etc. So obviously the movements in powerlifting aren't. So obviously they are balanced, but not as much as, as doing a snatch or clean, whatever, which could explain why sometimes you can just fail without being able to exert enough force to exert enough force to move the weight. But again, I always had that idea that, you know, it's, it's okay to fail. And as long, so I would much rather personally or with an athlete that I coach, have him fail in training. We see what's wrong, whether it be the way he perceives the movement, whether it be the program we, we put together, whether it be his technique, I would much rather have this lift in training and then be like, oh, okay, that was the problem. And then we have a solution. We come up with that solution. And then on midday, we know every single thing that can go wrong. And we have a plan and a solution to every single one of that thing. And that's something that I'm really, really big on with the personal coaching that I do. So for instance, with Tiff, because we train together, so it's a little easier you know, to immediately sure. see what's wrong, talk about it with her and, and then adapt. But usually when she's okay, she's like, yeah, so I think I can, I can go up, even if it's not what I thought she was capable of hitting because she, she's exceeding that to a certain extent. And in my head, I'm like, okay, even if she overshoots like 0 0.5, 1 RPE, if we get something out of that single lift or experience that can like put her way, way, way more, give her a better understanding of her movement, her, our yeah. programming strategy, whatever, I think it's, it's worth the risk. And if she fails, I'll be like, okay, then just, just lower the remaining of the work you have to do in order to not exceed the overall fatigue that we want you to be at for that given yeah. session. And that's it. I think people make fatigue a monster. If, if you're fatigued, then you dial it back for your given session, two sessions, three sessions, and then you're back on track. You don't have to restart your whole block, go into right. an emergency deload or things aren't okay. <laughs> Accept to have one or two shitty sessions from time to time. When you have a, yeah. a shitty session, I'm like, okay, today nothing will happen. Nothing magical will happen. So I will focus on my technique. I will focus on the work that I have to do. And instead of being like, oh, that would be sweet if I could hit 240 for three reps on squat or B8, I will do 220, 225, and I will be happy and glad with the execution that I will have and be like, what I'm doing right now will do me good later for my other sessions or the remaining of my block. Yeah. Reminds me of something. I w was hoping we would get to this. So you said something to me some a few months ago that I thought was really, really smart and worth platforming a bit more. So I'll read back your own words to yourself here, but I'm trying to remember the context. I think it was in the context of a miss or a grindy rep or something like that. And you said, from what I've seen, Failing a lift is almost always interpreted as a failure, either that you didn't respect the RPE or the stress or that you ruined the momentum of the block, where I'd consider it more as a frame to follow than absolute rules. I think that technique plays a way bigger role in our sport than many people think. The movement may not seem that complex. So failure doesn't always equal a bad calculation of your abilities or the load that you should use. It can very well be a technical inefficiency you can clear up and that's going to help you in the long run where if you stop failing a lift overreaching in terms of stress you won't go that far into technical work so i think there's a lot there and i think specific focus in this particular conversation was on the technique that you learn and especially once you've been at this for a little while is fairly stable you do have to really push it uh, to, for those to present a technical challenge to the lifter. And I was having this conversation and uh, agreeing with you and also holding up that I also think there's a, a grit aspect going on here that I think trying something that's hard, trying something that attempting a weight that scares you a bit, but doing it anyway is probably just good for you. Either 
either athletically or personally. <laughs> I think yeah. I think there's some just good that happens there. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So I think my my points with that is so I think you you reinvented the wheel with RPE and you gave you gave the context everybody needed in order to understand programming, stress, fatigue management, stuff like that. I think without that, we wouldn't be here like as a sport in general, no, not mentioning friends, US, whatever, just as a sport, we wouldn't be here without your understanding and, and your teaching of the RPE system. But I think, so again, you, I, mean, I use pretty much only RPE. I think that's the best thing ever. But I think sometimes it drives people away because they're like, oh, I was supposed to do it RP8 and then it's RP7.5. So what do I do? Do I add 2.5 or, and then maybe it's 8.5 and, and then, and people make it something mathematical, you know, something. But at the end of the day, so there's that example that I use and it's definitely not a smart example, but it like people understand immediately the idea. Let's say I take your absolute max on that day and, you know, so it's RP10, right? And then I tell you, hey, you know what? I have your whole family. I have a gun at their faces. And if you don't do that weight, RP8, I'm going to kill them. 99% of people will do it RP8 because the circumstances in which you were, if I just tell you, hey, go for a max RP10. And then if I tell you I have your whole family and they're probably going to die if you don't do that lift, you'll find another gear. So I, again, I, I don't think it's an incredible example, but it, it just shows that RPE isn't that mathematical thing that, yeah, RP10 is your absolute max on that day. And you can, it's, it's a lot circumstances based and also individual based. So what I, what I like to think of is if you're, so sticking to the RPE is, is the way to go, right? That's, that's obvious. But sometimes you also have to think outside the box and, and accept the risk. Like, if you do something RP7, you have to do you have to sing, hit a single RP9. Great, you add that many kilos on the bar. You always have that possibility of having a technical error, whatever, that will make the lift harder or that will make you fail the lift. And if at every failure you stop, you're like, okay, I have to dial back everything. You have to do that. I have to. Then you won't you won't really go that far. And on the on the other side, if you accept that risk and you're like, okay. I think it's it's worth the risk. I think I pretty much assessed my strength for the day. I think that's what I, I'm supposed to hit. Then you have to go without the fear of overshooting or failing that lift or whatever, because then you're not focused on what you have to do. And I, I think personally and with the athletes that I coach, we learn so much more things with the failures than we do with the successes. Obviously, you learn a lot with the successes, but what you learn from failures usually will help you not redo the same failures, whether it be programming or technical yeah. or technical stuff. Yeah, I agree with you there that you do learn more from the, the failures and that pushing it, especially in the context of a single set here and there, perhaps at strategic parts of, of the program. I like what you said that you have to take some risk. And when you take risks, sometimes it doesn't work out. They need to be calculated and you need to understand that it might not work out and that if it doesn't, then you're okay paying the price for that, but that it's not a catastrophic thing to, to miss a weight in training or something like that, or to overshoot an RPE. Um, I do think that you can, there's uh, two ends of the spectrum. There's a person that you've been talking about where they've overshot, maybe they've missed some weights this week. It's just not going well. So emergency deload kind of response. And then there's the other end of the spectrum where it's just like pretend nothing happened and stick to the program. And if I had to choose one, I suppose I would choose the pretend nothing happened, stick to the program approach. But I don't think either one is technically correct. And you explained a scenario earlier where you were you talked about maybe you can just dial back a couple sessions and let the recovery happen over the next couple sessions, maybe a week or two, if it's really bad. I think that's a very sensible thing to do. That's probably, that's the approach that I've been driving toward in my own coaching for the last, I don't know, quite a, quite a while now. And try, I do prefer the mathematics of things. So I have a tendency to try to mathematize it all, but it doesn't have to be that, but the right answer is some sort of adaptation. Now, if we're talking about overshooting your top set by half an RPE, yeah, there's probably some 
adjustment that could be made, but it's probably also not noticeable. And you're maybe you undershoot a set later on in the week that's by half an RPE. That's all the accounting that needs to happen anyway. So I, I don't think it has to be overly thought through. But if you do find yourself where you've dug yourself into this fatigue hole, then yeah, so you make some adjustments over the next couple of sessions and you're back in business and it doesn't necessarily need to be a momentum stopping event. Yeah. So what's what's funny is what you just said is you're really on that big on that mathematical aspect of things. Yeah. And I'm definitely not. Given my background, so you know, I was studying law. So I'm more so a concept guy, rules, stuff like that. And it's it's funny to see that again, I, I share the, um, the principle, your approach. I follow the classrooms, RTS, everything. But you know, I was always trying to stick up to the mathematical aspects, sides, and I was usually usually I, I was doing them and then I was like at it's it's not me, you know, it's it's not how yeah. I think. So I, I, I can't stick to something that doesn't make sense to me. And it's not it doesn't make sense, like it's not it's not logical. It's it's to me it it isn't because I yeah. I don't understand that logic, right? There's and definitely it, it's funny to see that. There's the differences between people, right? But I tend to think in a numbers oriented way. But it's still take take techniques, for example. If we're talking about a squat or a deadlift, there's a certain feeling that comes along with doing it correctly. And uh, how do you generate that? It varies from person to person. Sometimes there's different cues, and we all know that cues, the good cues differ from athlete to athlete. But ultimately, what you're trying to do is to get them into the correct position with the correct tensions. And that's a feeling sort of thing. How you get there is going to be based on that person. And I think a lot of programming ends up being that way. Where I'm coming from is people would talk about learning how to train themselves and kind of learning to listen to their body and uh, things of that nature. I'm a numbers oriented person. So the systems I develop are also numbers oriented, but it's still a way of exporting the knowledge of generating a, a correct experience, generating an a, a ideal experience. Whether that comes from a numbers approach or not, I think is less important. Sorry, I interrupted you. <laughs> yeah, monologue about no, that. No, 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 absolutely not. I think that's that's what's the coolest with with conversations like like that is, um, although we 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 don't use so, again, I, I follow the same concepts as you and mm -hmm. overall idea. I would say again, then with the way we we put things in action they that's where they differ and the way also the scope we use to analyze what's going on also will differ and i had that conversation with jason and ben in south africa a couple of months ago and so basically i, I think jason summarized it and i was like okay that's the best summary summary yeah, okay sure, that's summary. the best summary i ever heard of of our profession of our job and he was like so powerlifting is quite simple. You just have to load the bar with the correct amount of weight for the cor correct amount of reps for the correct amount of sets and the correct number of times per week. That's it. And I was like, I don't have anything to answer to that besides yeah. that's it, you know. And and then the way you you end up finding those answers will definitely differ from coach to coach and also for any given athlete that will really differ. But then I think that's that's it, and you you can have the approach you want. And again, I, I, my approach isn't heavily numbers approach. Mm -hmm. It's more so concepts, facts, analysis, conversations, stuff like that, rather than okay. So on the first week, you'll do seventy percent of your run right. RM for that number of volume, those many kilos, tonnages, whatever, and then we'll dial and you know. So yeah, but but for instance, Jason's approach would would be that it would be way more mathematical than mine. But at the end of the day. You just have to find the right answer for the right person. Yeah. And if we could look into a crystal ball and come up with what the right weight and the right number of reps is, then it wouldn't matter whether it doesn't matter whether you get there from a percentage or an RPE or from some crystal ball that you're hiding, you know, that as long as that's the program that you do, then you get the response that you get. So yeah, I, definitely. Gosh, there was, <laughs> so I wrote a bunch of notes here and we're not going to get to even half of it, <laughs> if that's all right. I wanted to ask you a bit more about what are the primary levers that you pull in when you're adjusting a training program? For you, 
you're starting from this lens of very high specificity. Contrast that with something like like maybe the approach that I might take where there are specific elements of a training program and then some elements that are pretty highly non-specific. So one of the levers that we'll pull is exercise selection, trying different accessory movements and seeing which ones correlate to better performances and things like that. So if that if you start with that maybe not completely off the table but to the side a bit more. What are some of the primary things that you do to individualize training when you're working with a new athlete? So uh, usually I pretty much use, again, I don't want to say I use your approach as I, I know 100% your approach, but so basically what I do is I determine the athlete's needs based off videos that I have of him. If they're complete beginners, obviously that would be different, but if they already have some training experience, and then I will immediately do a technique assessment. So not only in order to write the program off of that, but also to give them guidance immediately on the technical aspects, because again, I think you can progress 20 kilos just off of a technical adjustment. To the same extent, you can progress 20 kilos just off of a program adjustment. So you, you have to do both, right? So that's that's what I do. Then based on that, of that, obviously, I'll have the selection. Again, my exercise selection library isn't as wide and has as much variables as yours because of the, the fact that I usually, again, it's it's not that I am I'm anti-accessories. It's usually I don't program them. But from time to time, this happens, obviously. But then, yeah, exercise selection. Then, obviously, what I will do is I will determine a stress range on every given session. So if they squat twice a week, I will determine a, re- a stress range for the first session, second session. Kind, kind in a way of like primary and secondary and tertiary days. But given the fact that I don't have any leverage on the exercise specificity because everything remains quite specific this doesn't play that much of a role in that aspect and then obviously what i'll do is i'll choose the the pattern of of reps sets and then yeah then what i do from that is i monitor everything every week i usually try not to make too many changes too often because i think then you have 20 different noises and you can isolate the one that you're interested in so unless something really goes off for an athlete i will have them stick to it for two to three weeks when i'm starting up with them and then seeing from there and usually what i do is i like i told you i usually have those sbd days and i tend to use those sbd days to monitor the the results of the program we're doing so if everything trends in the right direction that's good we can we can stick to what we're doing if not then make some changes and and stuff like that definitely that makes sense so are you you're covering a pretty wide range of intensity zones over the course of that week as well do you are you concerned very much with having blocks that are too similar to one another how do you make sure that you're like one block to the next block that there's enough difference from one to the next or is that not something that you're too concerned about so that's that's tricky because usually if something goes well i I won't change it because i I used to do it i used to change it even if something went well i was like okay let's let's try something really different and then if if this doesn't go well then the athlete is completely lost and you're like yeah but we needed to do that in order to be back to it later and you're like yeah but then why why would the athlete do a block that derails him completely like whether it be from his performance perspective or also from his psychological perspective because i think we're doing us where we're completely crazy about us our sport and if training goes well we're a happy human being and if training goes wrong we're (laughs) a sad and depressed human being so as coaches we also have that burden you know we have that burden that (laughs) the athlete has to perform otherwise he's a sad human being right um (laughs) so that's complicated but yeah, so I used to I used to do that quite often. So change quite often and and do some really sub- substantial changes. But then when things didn't go well, I, I was like, I I felt bad for the athlete because I was like I, I did that in order to try something else and and put him in a different position and stuff like that and and also to experiment sometimes to see what we could do later later, and then having one block or two blocks because. If one block was a complete mess, then it's hard to catch it up immediately. The block afterwards, you first have to catch your momentum again, etc. So 
wasting two to three blocks of an athlete's career. At the end of the day, I was like, I don't think it's worth it. So if yeah. things go well, I will have changes, but changes that will remain in a given scope that won't change the essence of the program that we're running, whether it be stress-wise, volume-wise, exercise selection-wise, stuff like that. Interesting. So in your case, you're able to keep the training more consistent from block to block. Yeah, I suppose something that I've noticed is the, I don't know, there's so many details that are different between the approaches. So who knows to what extent these things generalize to, to each of our approaches here. But I've definitely had athletes where if we kind of keep things too much the same, then progress plateaus and we need to get away from the same stimulus. And then when we come back to it, progress can resume for a while at least. What the exact mechanism, though, is less clear because I definitely have enough noise in the programs that I write that it, it may be difficult to tell. Is it the exercise selection? Is it the intensity combination? Is it, and to some extent, that may not be a knowable thing because it's all coming together in this one package that you, you adapt to the whole program. And I don't think it's necessarily bits and pieces. Oh, you adapt to the exercise, but then you adapt to the intensity separately. No, it's, it's all one stimulus. I'm not sure what the main driver is to it, but it does seem like there's training sensitivity. A sensitivity to a stimulus is something that, that I think about, but I, I definitely think that's interesting that your experience goes in a different direction there. Um, the thing I always is, look for I stuff like that because that helps to drive experimentation a bit more. Yeah. You know, it, it causes you to question, say, okay, I, I, I think I have this observation. And how sure am I that I have that observation? Should I try it with the variables lined up in a slightly different way? Do I still have that observation? Yeah. So it's it's complicated because, again, I think yeah, I'm completely biased in that in that idea in that sense that I'm somebody extremely routine like i like my routine i like to have things in a certain order quite quite frequent not a lot of changes etc cetera, etc cetera. so obviously i will transfer that over to my job because i'm a human being and the coach isn't a different person than the human being that i am right right but what i would say is i think people tend to not accept the fact that sometimes you won't progress in a block you won't progress from week to week you Sometimes you just have to eat sand. I like this idea. You have to eat sand for eight weeks and then you can maybe start to progress back. So obviously during those eight weeks, like you said, you can change the program. You can have various stimulus. You can have differences in your approach, differences in the exercise selection, whatever. You can, you can change a lot of things. But then you can also accept that, you know, if, if we were to progress 2.5 kilos increments every week, every two weeks, within two to three years, we're all world champions. And that's not how right. it goes, right? So that's something that I, I usually tend to focus on is as long as the athlete feels right, as long as he's all right with what we're doing, I, I don't think it's mandatory to have changes if he isn't progressing. Sometimes you just have to work to catch the wave and then once the wave is here you ride it for as long as you can and then you're like okay back to square one i have to recreate a new wave and you could do that by having a, a completely different approach program stimulus change coach which is sometimes something that athletes do or you can just be like okay that's just the period that i need to work and put in hours efforts weeks and then back on back on my progress you know yeah. Yeah. And th I think that's a fair point. That's definitely a decent approach that there's, it's not guaranteed that we can call on that progress just whenever we want it. that even you can line up the variables as, as well as you can, but that still doesn't necessarily mean that it's a guarantee. That's definitely more cultivating a garden than it is building a, a car. Then yeah, uh, that, that's hard. That's hard to, to accept it as a coach <laughs> that wants to help people out. That's really hard. Yeah. But but I think yeah. from my experience, I was like, <sighs> I think in Make a way... progress when you can. And yeah, then yeah. when you can't, then figure something else out. Yeah. yeah I think that's, that's a else. totally valid approach. Yeah. That, that's something else could be, like you said, we change those variables. 
and obviously when something doesn't work I, I do change variables but it's more yeah. so I tend to remain in the in a certain scope that maybe other coaches yeah. wouldn't in order to to have enough of a change in stimulus but yeah but I, I like to there's have there's only it. so many different things that you can try in a given span of time there's lots of possibilities options that you could do but you have to have some sort of I think there's a lot more heuristic going on even maybe it's even subconscious or I know that a lot of it is subconscious a lot of decisions that get made by a coach whenever you're making any sort of programming change that we're not even necessarily aware of but you know what really highlights this if you ever try to to write down all the rules or you try to make a spreadsheet or something that's going to auto generate training it's incredibly difficult to do it's incredibly difficult to try to export all that knowledge when you start to really think through like well it depends on this and that and the other thing it depends on where in the week is this occurring what happened before it, what happened after it what's the overall context there's so much that goes into the decision making that it's it's difficult to to put all the options on the table so i think it's perfectly fine it's sensible to to narrow the scope of possible options and then if you have gone through most of those options and nothing seems to be working, then you experiment a bit wider. I think that's definitely a sensible approach. And I enjoy the that kind of coaches tend to draw the draw a box around different sets of things. Like maybe somebody is, like we mentioned, I tend to change exercises a bit more. You probably make different kinds of changes within the weekly structure more than I do. I think my weekly structure changes tend to be a, a little bit more heavy handed. Definitely differences in tendencies. I'll say that the the tendency of starting with very highly specific training and then bringing in accessories and things like that as needed is probably a, a stronger logical position to start. It's just that, like you mentioned, a lot of us, we all bring with us our backgrounds and the th all the things that we've learned and experienced up to this point, and that kind of informs the decisions we make going forward. Yeah. And on that note, I think you did an an app where where you like like what you just said, you do that on the app, right? You you were like, okay, this if this happens and under those circumstances, then the app does that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You did that, right? Yeah, I've been trying to <laughs> trying to write down the logic for a long time now, and it's it's really difficult to do. And to some extent it's not I don't know that it's possible to get to to make everything an expressly written rule that there's pretty much always going to be heuristics and coaches look at it and they go, oh, that looks about right. And I think that's fine to do. You know? Yeah. I, I just find that, you know, amazing. So it, <laughs> I think, I think if somebody can pull it off, I, I would, I would bet my money on you. So oh, thanks. I appreciate it. Man, like I said, I wrote down a bunch of stuff. I asked for questions online as well and got to very little of it, but that's fine. I've had some things that I wanted to ask you. I appreciate your time and I would love to sit down and chat with you again. I'm sure that we could come up with plenty of things still to talk about. So what's coming up next for you? I know that you just competed at Europeans. So what's next on your radar? So things didn't go as planned in 2022 for me, globally, yeah. I would say. Coaching coaching was fine. So that's a good thing. I'm more so talking about me as yeah, an athlete. Definitely. So yeah, I, I plan on I plan on so in two months i have the qualifier for worlds which mm -hmm. will happen in france so i have to do that and then obviously the next big comp is worlds so looking mm -hmm. forward to be a be a contender to the to the 66 kilo throne yeah do you the to qualify is that do you have to go all out at that competition or can you mm -hmm. just no so the qualifier in france in my weight class is 650 which is a total like and hit like really yeah easily since i didn't have a, a good meet in 2022 i do plan on trying to to have a good meet so if i can yeah. if i can let it all out and and put up a 700 plus performance i think i'll i'll aim for that yeah awesome man that would be great to see i know that i'll be cheering for you and uh, looking you. forward to that man good Thank luck you. Appreciate to it. you in a couple of months and i'll definitely be seeing you in malta yeah so, absolutely that will be amazing yeah. Malta right. is, a, is a nice place, so I think yeah. Worlds in 2023 will be something special. I'm looking forward to it. All right, man. Thanks again for your time. Thanks Thank everyone you for much. watching and listening, and we'll see you guys next time.